to Laura, and good morning, guys. I good morning. Um, I really am grateful. Uh, genuinely, I'm grateful that you guys decided to join us today. Um, you know, we we appreciate that you guys want to spend your Sunday mornings with us, and I truly believe that God has an appointment with everybody in this room today. So I ask that you give me the next 10 to 15 minutes of your time because God wants to meet with you personally. And I think he brought you here for a reason. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open your Bible to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to be spending our time there today, specifically in verses 8 through 11. But <clears throat> before we get into that, I want to kind of overview what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about the concept of stewardship today, stewardship. And stewardship is really just a fancy word that means to manage something. So specifically managing something that somebody has given to us. You know, when we are being a good steward, we want to take what somebody else has given to us and use that to make a good result. So when we look at that in the context of our relationship with God and in the context of this passage, we want to use the gifts, talents, abilities, resources that God has given us to bless the people around us. Okay, so that's kind of where we're going to go today, and I want you guys to think through how the text speaks into that for us. And as I thought about my own personal life, and what stewardship has looked like for me, and how I've seen stewardship modeled by the people that I've done ministry with, a, a couple came to my mind immediately. Um, this was during my time in Florida, so I took a gap year between my undergrad and my grad school, and I spent some time in Florida. And when I was down there, as I was looking for a local church to get involved in, I came across this, this a smaller church, but a pastor and his wife um, had, are, were running this church, and he was actually bivocational. He was a full-time doctor, but he would preach on Sunday mornings. He would provide Wednesday services. And the awesome part about this church that I found is that it really operated as kind of a place for people to come and worship the Lord, but it also kind of operated as a community center. And what I mean by that is Sunday they would have their service, Wednesday they would have their service, but Monday through Saturday they opened this place up to invite some of the least fortunate members of society to come and just get a meal, watch a movie, have a cup of coffee. They would invite people in. And what it did was it, it created this environment where people could let their guard down, where people who... Other people in society don't give them the time of day, but hey, you can come in here, you can have a meal, and you can just talk to us for a little bit. And the reason I bring this story up, <clears throat> and, and the reason I want to talk about this with you guys, is because they served these people, because they were providing for them, and because they cared about their well-being, it opened so many doors for the gospel to take hold. And I think that's really what service does in general. When we serve other people, when we want to help other people and use the things that God has put in our lives to help them, it, it builds trust and it builds an environment where they're more likely to hear you out. They're more likely to hear what you have to say, what you believe, what you believe to be the truth. And I think that that is really a great avenue that service provides and stewardship provides. Is it opens doors, it builds trust and relationships for the gospel to take hold. So... As we read the text today, as we think through what does stewardship look like for us and how can we serve people and steward the things that God has given us well, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about how can I serve other people? Where am I, what am I passionate about and what am I skilled in that I can go out and serve other people with the intent to love them and with the intent to share the truth with them, okay? So 1 Peter chapter 4, right there in verse 8, it says this. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of the God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God provides, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So right there, right away, in verse 8, Peter's going to get our attention. He says, above all. And I've kind of told you guys in the past, when you see those words above all, our interest should spike, our attention should peak up, 
and we should say, okay, whatever comes after those words are probably pretty important. And they are important. He says, above all else, keep loving one another diligently or earnestly or deeply, your translation might say, since love covers a multitude of sins. And just looking at verse 8 there for a second, when I initially read this passage, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, it makes sense that love covers sins, but how does that actually play itself out? What does that actually look like? And how does love actually cover up sins? Well, my immediate reaction was, well, where else in the Bible does it talk about this? Where else in the Bible can I go to that it talks about the covering of sins, specifically in the context of loving people? And what we find is this exact phrasing shows up periodically throughout Scripture. I just want to highlight a few places for you today. Proverbs 10 verse 12 says this, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. So what do I think about when I think of strife? Obviously here it's the opposite of covering up sins. So what does that mean? It's the uncovering of sins. It's always looking for where other people are messing up. Always looking for a flaw. Always looking for an error in somebody else. That is stirring up strife. That is not being loving. So that's one way that love can cover up sins, not looking for the ways that people have sinned against us. Here's another way, James 5, 19 and 20. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save him from death and cover a multitude of sins. Okay, that one makes sense too, right? Somebody wanders away from the truth and I bring them back to the truth of the gospel. I bring them back to Jesus. And obviously, hopefully we know in this room that Jesus is the one that's able to ultimately cover our sins. Jesus is the one that's able to forgive us. So it makes sense in that context. But why is he talking about it here within the context of service? How does serving one another cover up sins? Why would Peter bring that up in this context? And here's what I think Peter's talking about. I think Peter's saying, hey, if, if your brother or your sister offends you, if they sin against you, if there's some conflict in a relationship between you and a brother or sister in Christ, you know one of the best play, ways to restore that relationship? You want to know one of the best ways to bring, um, bring about peace and restoration there? To serve one another. It's very hard to stay mad at somebody when that person's constantly trying to use what they've been given to bless your life, when they're constantly trying to help you out, and vice versa. If somebody's mad at me, if there's conflict towards me in a relationship, hey, how can I go and restore that? Let me think about how can I help this person? How can I use what I've been given to go and bless this person? So I think Peter's saying, hey, if I go out and I serve the people around me and I'm a good steward of the resources that God has given me, guess what? It's going to provide the covering up of sins is going to provide resolution to conflict within relationships. So that's what I think Peter's talking about in verse 8. But my second point is that Peter wants us to know that, yes, service is great. Service is something that we are expected to do by God. But really, we should check our heart behind the service. We should ask ourselves, what's the why behind the what you are doing? And here in verse 9, Peter's going to say, hey, show hospitality to one another, go out and serve one another, go out and be a good steward towards one another, but do that without complaining. That's a key here. Do that without grumbling. And, and the word, the Greek here for the word complaining means literally to mumble under your breath. So <clears throat> when I think of mumbling under my breath, what do I think of? Maybe I'm not out there shouting this to the people around me, saying, man, I hate whatever I have to do right now. I hate moving tables. I hate helping out and, and cooking a meal for this person or welcoming this person in my home and, and giving them my time and resources. Maybe I'm not doing that, but personally in my own heart, I'm mumbling under my breath. I'm saying, man, I know that I'm supposed to do this. I know that God's called me to do this. I know that my family has an expectation on me. I know that my pastor has an expectation on me. I know my church has an expectation on me to serve, but I don't really want to do it. So I'm going to complain in my own head about, man, I still have to do this. And Peter's saying, hey, check yourself for a second. Do you serve out of the joy of your heart? Do you understand that this is actually an amazing opportunity to bless other people and to glorify the Lord? Do you have the right mindset, the, the right perspective behind your service? And I think Peter's saying, hey, take a, take a minute. 
It's great that you're serving, but do that without complaining. Do that out of the joy of your heart. Do that out of an opportunity to share Christ with somebody else. So I think that is really the point that Peter's trying to make here. And also, I want you guys to think about what came to my mind is what did Jesus say about serving? Obviously, Jesus is going around all over the place. He's serving people constantly if you read the Gospels. But there's a point in time where he comes to his disciples and he says in the midst of all of this, hey, it's actually better for you to give than it is to receive. You are actually more blessed in your life if you are others focused and not constantly self-focused. If I have a perspective on life where I'm thinking constantly, how can I serve the people around me? How can I bless the people around me? How can I help the people around me? You'll actually find yourself happier than if you're constantly thinking about yourself. And I think that's kind of counterintuitive. I think sometimes we think, well, if I use all of my resources, my time, energy, effort, money, uh, everything that I've been given, if I use that for myself, that should probably make me the most happy. Jesus says that's actually not how it actually plays itself out. If you use your time, energy, effort, resources, money to bless the people that God has put in your life, what you'll find is that's one of the secrets to living a happy life. That is when we find ourselves experiencing the most joy. That is when we find ourselves experiencing the most happiness is when we're not constantly thinking about ourselves and we're thinking about how we can bless the people around us. And I think we can really take an example from Jesus in that. I think that we can, we can see that. And I would encourage you guys, if you, if you haven't experienced that, it truly is a reality. It tr you do truly find yourself more fulfilled, finding more purpose, finding more happiness when we're constantly thinking about how we can serve the people around us. So I would encourage you guys, get out there. Find a place that you can volunteer. Find a place that you can go and help somebody in your life. That really brings me to my last point, which is going to be wrapping up in the last few verses here. And that is this, to serve others is ultimately to serve God himself. This is what God calls us to. He invites us into this with him. Clearly God wants to bless people. Clearly God uses everything that he has to go out and give. He offers us his grace freely. We didn't do anything to earn his grace. We didn't any, do anything to earn his mercy, but he gives that to us in the same way we can bless the people around us and in effect serve God and honor God with our lives. But I want you to, to, to remind you guys of who's the audience that Peter is writing to? It's not a pastor. It's not just the deacons. It's really all of the Christians living in this region of the, in, in the world at the time. So it's people like you and me and, and ordinary people that come to church and he's saying, hey, all of you have been given spiritual gifts. All of you have been given things, passions, desires, abilities, talents, resources to bless the people around you. It's not an exception to a church leader. It's not an exception to somebody who's super strong or super advanced or super mature in their faith. It's everybody. Everybody who is in Christ is invited into this together. So if you're asking yourself, is this me? Yes, it is you. You know, whether you're speaking, whether you're actually going out and doing things, verse 11 there, all of this is ultimately used to glorify God. That is the result of our service. That is the coolest thing about all of this. When we serve other people, we're fulfilling the ultimate calling that God has invited us to. We're, we're loving other people well. And that's the greatest commandment according to Jesus, to love God and to love others. And Peter's saying, hey, it's not this super abstract idea, love is a very general idea. Very practically, you can go out and just simply use the things that you've been given to bless other people, and that's how you can love people. P Peter makes it a little bit more clear to us exactly how we can go out and live this out and apply this to our lives. Use the things that you've been given to bless those people and so honor God with your life. And just quickly, as we wrap up here, I want to remind you guys that the first step to good stewardship is always connecting with the source, the giver 
of whatever it is that you're stewarding. So if I don't know who gave me the things that I'm stewarding, how can I steward those things well? And ultimately, that is to know God because God is the one that given, has given you those things. And the Bible tells us in John chapter 14, Jesus is speaking to the people and what he says is, I'm the way, the truth, and the life and nobody comes to the Father except for me, through me. In other words, nobody has a relationship with God who doesn't know me. I'm Jesus. I am the Lord. I came and I died for your sins. And, and that is the path that God has created for you to have relation with him. And that's how we get connected to the source. That's how we get connected to the giver of our talents, abilities, and resources so that we can go out and bless other people. So that's step one. And my encouragement for you this morning is if you're confused about that or you don't understand that, Please do not leave this building today without understanding that. Come to me. Come to your small group leader and ask the questions to get clarity of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. We're not going to force you into anything. We're not going to pressure you to make any decisions. We just want you to understand so that you can make a decision for yourself, truly. So do not leave here today without understanding that. But we are going to go into small groups here in just a second. Um, let me pray for you guys. If this is your first time here, just come and see me at the front of the stage and I'll point you in the right direction for where you need to go for your small group. But I'll pray for us and we'll dive right into small groups today. So, Father.